Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for having us here today. I need to start with a confession. Until about two years ago, I didn't even know what open source software or open data was. And now here I am, standing here talking to all of you who are experts in precisely that. But what I can say that I know a fair amount about is sustainability, and more specifically, sustainability in the fashion industry. So as you heard, my name's Katie, and I'm one half of a team leading the stakeholder engagement for a, a massive open source project that is starting to revolutionize the apparel industry. And together with Deb, I'm going to talk to you today about how that's fundamentally changing lives and conditions for some of the most vulnerable people in apparel supply chains. Before Deb talks you through what the Open Apparel Registry is, I'm going to give you, frankly, a fairly depressing overview of the current state of the global fashion industry. And I want to stress that this isn't about high fashion. If you wear clothes, and looking up at you all now, I'm relieved to say that you do, um, these issues affect you. To start with some context, According to Fashion United, the global fashion industry is worth 3 trillion US dollars, or 2% of the world's GDP. Globally, the industry employs 60 million people throughout the value chain. 80% of those garment workers are women aged between 18 and 35. Many of those women have children and families to support, and quite often they are the main income earner. But rights for those workers are frequently limited, and verbal, physical, and sexual abuse are rife. In addition to that, slave, bonded, and child labor are commonplace. But fashion's also an industry that exhibits enormous income disparity, with two of the Forbes top 10 wealthiest people in the world being fashion industry leaders. So on the slide, you can see Bernard Arnault, who's the chairman and chief exec of LVMH, which is a, a, a global uh, fashion brand which owns brands including Dior, Givenchy, and Louis Vuitton. And on the flip side, you can see Amancio Ortega, who arguably invented fast fashion through the creation of his brand, Zara, which is part of what's gone on to become the Inditex group. But at the other end of the scale, you've got thousands of workers toiling away in garment factories, adding to the wealth of that industry elite. And these people aren't even earning a minimum wage, let alone a living wage. So we've touched briefly on wealth disparity and the lack of living wages for workers in garment supply chains. But sadly, these aren't the only issues affecting the industry. Many people in the audience may recognize this tragic moment in history, the 23rd of April, 2013, when the Rana Plaza building in Dhaka, Bangladesh, collapsed, killing over 1,100 people working inside that building and, killing over, uh, and injuring over 2,500 more. Those people were garment workers, creating products for major global fashion brands. But on the morning that the building collapsed, workers had spotted cracks in the walls and expressed concern about going into the building. But those workers were told by their managers that if they didn't go into work, they wouldn't just lose their salary for that day, they'd lose their jobs. With little alternative, fearful but desperate, the majority of those workers entered the building that day, but with horrific consequences. And all of this in order to meet impossibly tight turnarounds that are imposed by global fashion brands on factories to feed our appetite for fast fashion. But the issues in fashion aren't solely social, and actually it's an industry that wreaks environmental havoc on the planet. As an industry, loads of stages of production are dependent on heavily chemically intensive processes for dyeing and the finishing of products. Not only does this affect the health of workers who are handling those chemicals, but it also has impacts on waterways and local ecosystems. And often, with those waterways, that's where people who live locally to those garment facilities are going. They're going to use the water there for their washing, but also they're sourcing water from those, from those riverways to cook and drink. So how has this been allowed to happen? Global fashion supply chains are incredibly complex and quite often pretty murky for a variety of different reasons. Creating an item of clothing isn't as simple as it's often low cost implies. That made in Vietnam label in your t-shirt is just telling one part of the story, where, your, where that t-shirt was finally cut and sewn. Think of all of the steps before that. 
Where was the cotton grown and by whom? How did that cotton get from the farm to the ginner and the spinner? And that's the place where the yarn, where the yarn is spun and the fabric's produced. Who, what, what processes went into the dyeing and the finishing treatment? What about the pattern cutting and stitching it all together? Who did that? And what about the buttons? Where did they come from? Who fixed that shiny piece of embellishment onto, your, onto the chest of your shirt? And then there's the care labels and the brand labels that have to be stitched into the neck. Who did that work? And if your shirt looked nicely ironed when you bought it, chances are that happened in a different factory as well. So I think you get the impression that creating fashion in and of itself is a pretty complex process, and then throw in buyers from global fashion brands who are being set challenging targets to consistently secure lower prices, and you're left with our globalized fashion system where producing one simple T-shirt can involve multiple shipments between multiple different countries. And then think about all those steps that were involved in producing that one simple T-shirt. And, and remember this, that's just one item in the inventory of brands that are producing thousands upon thousands of products around the world every week. When you're dealing with that many layers, keeping track of data in your supply chain as seemingly simple as name and address becomes incredibly challenging. And what we found in building the Open Apparel Registry is that at as basic a level as name and address information, the quality of data in the apparel industry is poor. We hear stories of auditors turning up at the same factories two days in a row, thinking that they're going to a different place. And we've also heard stories of improvement programs being run twice in the same facilities. And as you can see from the, uh, from the examples on this slide, some brands think that Athens is in the UK and that Haiphong is apparently in India. So what is the Open Apparel Registry and how can it help? I'm going to hand over to Deb now, who will talk you through that. Thank you. So now that you're thoroughly depressed and concerned about ever buying a t-shirt again, I'm here to talk about how the OAR is working to improve the situation. So what is the OAR? We are a neutral, open source tool for mapping garment facilities worldwide and assigning a unique ID number to each of them. At the most basic level, you can't fix a problem if you don't know where your factories are and if you aren't able to identify them in a single way. So let's listen to a brief overview about what we're trying to accomplish with the OAR. So what does the OAR do? At its core, it is a data project. Our goal is to create a single registry that is fed by databases from lots of different organizations and to apply an industry-specific ID number to each facility. This would eliminate issues with inconsistent matching across databases and would it enable in-facility collaboration so that we're not having these repetitious uh, audits that Katie was just describing. So what does that unique ID number look for? 
essentially we're not replacing any other ID systems. We are creating a central source of truth that has different components. So we have a country ID, we have an origin date, which is when the facility was added to the OAR, we have a general ID, and then a check ID. And at this point, we're talking about data that's coming from literally hundreds of different sources, brands, multi-stakeholder initiatives, civil society organizations, lots of different groups. So there's a lot of data that needs to be matched. So that's super simple, right? Like, no big deal. We can map supply chains across a global economy, no problem. Obviously, there's some technical challenges. And I want to focus on two that we've specifically solved using open source software. So first of all, we have an issue with the data because it's always data. As a project manager, if I see a project come in that involves data, particularly publicly contributed data, I automatically double our, the estimate of the time we're going to spend on it. Data is complicated. So we have in this situation data that's coming from low tech contributors, there's no industry-wide standards. Often the data has been extracted from PDFs and then run through OCR, so it's super messy. And that's on top of all of the normal data issues such as transliteration, non-structured addresses, and international character sets. This is a great example. This is you know, over 10 different ways of referring to what we think is the same facility with slight derivations in the address and in the name. What makes the, the situation more complex is that in the apparel industry, you may have facilities that are at the same address but on different floors and considered different facilities. They may even have a name that's very remarkably similar, but they need to be treated as two separate entities. So matching all of these disparate pieces of data is very challenging. Here's a great example. Let's say we have 50,000 facilities in the OAR. A brand wants to upload a list of 5,000. That would be 250 million comparisons if we're checking on a one-to-one -one scale. That could take up to seven hours. In 2019, seven hours for data calculation is not acceptable. We needed to find a shortcut. Our solution was to use dedupe, which is an open source Python library for accurate and scalable fuzzy matching, record deduplication, and entity resolution. I'm giving the very broadest overview, and I would highly recommend checking out the project on GitHub. Essentially, rather than having to check each individual character against another individual character, you define groups of data into something called a block. Those blocks share very similar characteristics and then can be compared to each other, so there's fewer comparisons with greater confidence. This has taken us from seven hours to less than four minutes. And honestly, it's way less than four minutes, but uh, I'm a project manager, so I like to under-promise and over-deliver, so we'll go with four minutes. What's our other main technical issue? It's the map. Azavia is a geospatial software firm. Maps are our bread and butter, but we had some unique constraints in this issue. First of all, we had to use a Google base map because we were using a Google geocoder. That locked us into certain technologies that made it more challenging to display certain items on the map. But we had a lot of user feedback that they really wanted to be able to view all facilities at once. So initially, we were only displaying 500 facilities on the map. But when you have thousands of facilities in Bangladesh or China alone, that, that's not acceptable. You need to be able to see everything at once. But we can't sacrifice performance, and we have a limited budget. And then there's the sticky issue of geopolitical boundaries, where putting a dot on the map is not quite so simple when you're talking about shifting geographic stances. So this is what it used to look like. Pretty standard clusters, but again, we were limited to 500, and we were getting feedback that that just was not going to work. So our solution was to implement vector tiles. Has anybody worked with vector tiles here before? Oh, not a mapping crowd. OK, you should check them out. They're really cool. Um, essentially, it's support for serving web map images very quickly where features are styled on the client. We used a post just function and added a vector tile endpoint to our Django web application. This allowed us to display literally tens of thousands of points, and we can scale infinitely, essentially, to be able to aggregate them at low zoom levels implement them as a hex grid, and then display them in a variety of ways. We chose circles with colors and sizes that changed based on the density of the facilities, based on user feedback. But you could do any type of shape if you wanted. And that's what we get when we added that. So this is our pretty map that shows every facility that's in the OAR. As you zoom in, you get to individual points. But it allows you to get a sense of where, at scale, a large amount of the apparel industry is, being, um, is working. So, in summary, the benefits of the OIR is that we take this data that's coming from hundreds of different sources and create 
single identifiers for each facility that allow us to link things so that data isn't in silos anymore. We have an API that will be able to seamlessly push data through these, uh, through these systems to be able to push back against some of these abuses in the system. So the OAR has been live for seven months now, and in those seven months, we've gotten some great feedback about how already, just with the limited number of information we have, we've seen great benefits to uh, employees in the apparel industry. So to talk through some of those case studies, I'm going to turn it back to Katie. So yes, as Deb said, we're already receiving amazing feedback about how this seemingly really simple data and being able to see who's contributed that data is actually changing lives of really vulnerable people in garment supply chains. I'm going to talk you through three brief case studies which have come from an organization that recognized the potential of the OAR in our really early stages, way back in beta, the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. And they're a global organization that does phenomenal work advocating for the rights of workers in all kinds of supply chains. Earlier this year, the BHRRC responded to the dismissal of over 1,000 garment workers who had been striking over the payment of benefits in Cambodia. They used the OAR to identify the brands who were sourcing from the facilities that had sacked those workers. Two of those brands responded and launched investigations, and through pressure from all different quarters, but including those brand interventions, the majority of those workers got their jobs back. Moving on to um, issues in Bangladesh, where over 12,000 workers have been sacked, and this was a crackdown in response to nationwide wage protests. These protests were also met with deadly police violence, and they were over changes to the minimum wage, which has reached a level that experts recommend isn't even half of what it should be. But again, although the repression is ongoing, through working with the data in the OAR, the BHRRC is able to continue to identify brands that are associated with those facilities and work with them as developments unfold. And lastly, in uh, Mauritius earlier this year, there was a factory closure, and the BHRRC again was able to use data from our tool to trace back to the brands after that factory closure, and it, uh, which was one that had left a lot of Bangladeshi migrant workers stranded and owed unpaid wages. They reached out to the brands and went on to work with ASOS and a local trade union um, to ensure that some remedial steps were taken, and that included back wages, re-employment for some of those workers, and repatriation talks with the Mauritian government. And so even though there's a lot more to be done in terms of improving conditions in global supply chains, even these impacts that have been achieved wouldn't have been possible without the OAR. So what next, and how can you all help? So the OAR is an open source project, and there's a couple of ways that you as developers and other uh, workers in this industry can get involved. First of all, maybe you don't care about clothes. Maybe clothes aren't your thing. But there's probably something else that is your thing, whether it's bicycles or flowers or baby strollers or books or something. And there probably needs to be transparency into the supply chain for that item. There is no reason you couldn't fork the OAR co code and build it for another industry. Being an ethical consumer in the 21st century means thinking about where your stuff comes from, not just buying it off of the shelf. So our code is available on GitHub. If clothes are your thing, we welcome your contributions. There's a contributor document. There's a first good issue label that you're welcome to use to kind of focus where you're interested in being involved. And we welcome contributions for the community. We are a very small project, a handful of developers, some designers, a project manager. But we would love to think through how we can expand this project to really get more results like the ones we've seen in the case studies that Katie described. Um, I'm going to talk about consider your purchases and how you're purchasing clothing and reusing it, or actually whether ownership is even necessary at all. The outfit that I'm wearing now is one that I've rented. Search the OAR and discover who else is, uh, discover who's participating in transparency initiatives. The thing that's different about the OAR compared to the way that a lot of brands are disclosing data at the moment is that it means that the data can be used in practical ways because Data locked away in PDFs, it's just no good to anyone, really. Next, so, um, contact brands and manufacturers to encourage them to share their supply chains. You can use your influence as customers here. We know from people that we work with in this industry that, enough pe that if enough people ask brands who made my clothes, that question gets taken to board level and C-suite level. 
And finally, educate yourself on the issues. There are loads of really great resources out there now, whether that's books, films, documentaries, MOOCs that you can study. Come and ask me afterwards if you're interested, and I can share my top tips with you. And lastly, stay in touch and watch us continue to grow. This is just the beginning. Thank you. Thank you.